Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream on the 30th of January 2024. It's Martin North here from Digital Finance Analytics. Great to have you on this evening. We're going to have a very important conversation about the current economic trends, what's going on and uh, what might uh, play out in the uh, weeks and months ahead. Uh, of course, a lot of data flowing now after the uh, hiatus over the summer. So it'll be interesting to get Lee's take on what's going on. Just before I bring him in, let me remind you, as I always do, that uh, we're not providing specific financial or legal advice. It's a general conversation only. We do moderate the chat, but feel free to throw your comments in. And if you've got questions, remember to throw those in too. We can certainly um, take your questions and try and give you an answer. Uh, as at the 30th of January 24, if you're watching replay, if you would like to ask a question, use at Walk the World. That'll make sure it comes into my queue so I see it, because there's always plenty going on in the chat, and I don't necessarily always see everything that's being discussed. So if you use at Walk the World, then I'll see it. And also I've enabled Super Chat, which means you can get your question top of the list. Or indeed, if you'd like to make a contribution to what we do around here, always greatly appreciated. We do this not for profit because we think it's a really important conversation to have. So your support is greatly appreciated. Right. Let me bring Leith straight in. Leith, how are you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks, Martin. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me on again. <laughs> Great to have you back on, Leith. And uh, I see a slightly different locale this time. That's right, mate. I'm out in the man cave. So uh, basically, I decided uh, I'm going to change my location because, um, yeah, I've I always try and do these things inside the house, which during the middle of winter is fine because the kids tend to go a bit early. But I've got like a 15 year old and a, a 13 year old, and they tend to start a little bit later in summer. And I don't really want to be the sort of guy who says, "Look, shut up, I'm on the air." Uh, so. I just let them do what they got to do inside the house. I'm at the back, uh, a bit like a little granny flat, but no toilet or anything, just uh, basically my man cave. Uh, as you can probably tell by the post in the background, I'm a child of the 90s. Pearl Jam's my favourite band. And uh, let, let's go. Yeah, yeah. I was going to comment on the on the post. You, you beat me to it. Excellent. Well, uh, now, of course, um, you know, it's been summer, so presumably you've been, um, you know, around and about and away. But uh, as, as, as you've come back and as you're starting to get flows of data now, First of all, what's, what's your top level take? You know, the, the the expectation I think was late last year, the RBA is going to cut quickly, uh, inflation is going to get you know, tamed, um, we're not going to see a recession. Um, I feel that things have moved a bit since then. Yeah, look, I mean, my, my view uh, late last year was they're probably going to cut in the second half. Um, I still think they will. I think they'll probably cut, but probably towards, you know, later in the second half, but who the hell knows. Um, yeah, I think there were some there were some forecasts. Some some people were saying they might do it in the first half or in the first quarter, even which I think was a bit nuts. But uh, look, you know, I, th I think the you know inflation data has been uh, you know it's coming down everywhere. It's definitely coming down, and this is basically a, it's more the good side. So effectively, you know, over the pandemic, we had a lot of supply constraints and uh, what have you, a lot of factories shut down because uh, of you know lockdowns and that sort of stuff, and that basically you know. Um, uh, led to all these supply shortages, which initially is what pushed up inflation. Um, and then obviously the government's rolled out the stimulus and all that sort of stuff, which added to demand. And and then and then this, the inflation kind of morphed into services, which is the stickier part. But mm. we're sort of getting a, um, you know, a reversal of what happened over the pandemic where the supply side on the – anything that basically comes in off a boat is uh, is falling in price. I'm actually getting good deflation uh, you know, in a lot of, lot of areas. So – that's helping to pull down inflation. That's kind of happening pretty much across the board. Um, still got this, the, the services inflation, you know, the domestic inflation is still stickier. And, you know, in Australia, you see that most notably with with the housing side, you know, rents and, um, you know, housing construction costs and, you know, property insurance now is like, you know, one of the big, one of the massive things is rising. Um, so, you know, it's still got further to go, but I think the, the direction pretty much, Everywhere is now inflation's coming down, and it's actually coming down further uh, faster than a lot of the central banks thought. So, like you know, um, the US had a pretty soft inflation print. Um, the Reserve Bank in New Zealand had a print uh, late last week, which is basically below their expectations. Looks like looks like the RBA's inflation's like the quarterly gets released tomorrow, but um, based on the monthly data, I everything mean, looks like it's even falling a little bit faster than what the RBA thought. So, you know, the signs are pretty good. Uh, still, all these risks. You know, there's all that uh, Houthi rebels are, um, you know, smashing uh, supply convoys in the Middle East and whatever. I don't, I don't know. Look, I think that's probably more noise than anything, but it could be wrong. Uh, you know, it could end up being a, being a problem, but, um, you know, it's probably a rounding error, error right now. So uh, hopefully, you know, hopefully we're sort of at the back of this, uh, that the inflation dragon's slowly getting slayed as, 
uh, economies, you know, basically in their, their versions of per capita recessions. And, um, you know, demand's weak and, uh, you know, we're starting to get the inflation coming down. So hopefully that'll continue. And hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully, you know, if you're one of the third of Australians roughly who's uh, who, who's carrying a mortgage, you might get some relief later in the year because it's about bloody time. I mean, households are getting smashed, rents, mortgages and taxes at the moment. So, and also just general cost of living. We've had, you know, energy price, inflation, all the other stuff. So it's been a pretty crappy, um, you know, couple of years. If you're not one of the lucky third who owns their homes outright and doesn't rent and has obviously cash and bank who's, you know, had their interest interest income go up. So, you know, for everyone else, it's been pretty crappy. Yeah, and just a few um, data points there. Of course, one of the observations is that the um, supply of rental property continues to drop. And, of course, we've had the new influx of of students coming in. It might be slightly lower than last time around, but there's still, you know, significant demand for rental property. And and more broadly, the inflation parameters that we have in Australia have a smaller element of housing relative to some other countries, which I've always thought weird, bearing in mind that, you know, housing is the thing in Australia. Um, So we we seem to have a a CPI metric that is sort of a a little bit um, myopic when it comes to the impact of housing. Yeah, and look, I mean... (laughs) The, the fact that rents is only six percent of the CPI basket pretty much tells you tells you all. Um, you know, we've got about a third of households rent. It's I think it's just over a third actually, but you know, r- roughly a third rent, and they've seen their rents go up by you know thirty odd percent in uh, since in the past several years. Um, you know, since the pandemic, basically. Yet uh, we've got you know the CPI measure of rent is lagged because. Um, it takes a takes a CPI measures overall rents, whereas asking rents are on new rentals that come on. So it takes a while for them to feed in. But even when they do feed in, it's still only six percent of the CPI basket, which just you know on the face of it seems too low to me. Um, and overall housing uh, counts for about twenty two and a half percent, or about twenty two percent of the CPI basket. So that's rents plus you know the cost of building a home, insurances, all that sort of thing, uh, property rates, uh, all those sorts of things. So. In total, it's nearly a quarter, but not quite, or just over a fifth, the 25th and a quarter of the CPI basket. Um, in some other countries, it's actually a lot higher. So uh, the the rent component, which is only 6%, is a bit weird. And I think when the CPI, uh, when, when, when the ABS actually updates their CPI uh, inflation, so uh, CPI basket to reflect the new weights, I think they're actually going to, I think they'll actually end up upgrading it because that 6% is based on sort of pre-pandemic um, rental costs. And now, obviously, rents are taking up a higher share of household incomes. So I think those weights will probably mic up to 8% or something. I'm just guessing. Um, so I think that's, you know, they they uh, update the CPI basket periodically. And I think next time, they're actually going to increase the weight of rents, which will then um, would increase the CPI or other things equal, based given that we've got high rental inflation. Yes. And in fact, um, they did a little bit of tweaking some time ago and reduced, yeah, reduced the, uh, the housing component on the argument that more people were flying and traveling and therefore the um, uh, overseas travel costs, et cetera, et cetera, should have a bigger proportion, which I always thought, well, I wonder what proportion of Australians yeah. actually are flying, you know, <laughs> versus renting. Yeah, well, I mean, especially, so, so it's almost, it's so backward looking that it's the economy we don't have now. So mm. that's, the, you know, it, it's based on yesteryear, not what the situation is now, um, which is kind of ridiculous. So, uh, you know, and obviously we've got more and more people renting every year. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, yeah, it's, it, it, the whole thing's weird. And it's the reason why CPI is a cost of living measure is pretty crappy. Uh, so if you actually look at the, um, so the ABS does a separate quarterly measure, which is called the living cost indices. And that, and that basically breaks up households into different groups. So you've got employee households, which is the majority. Then you've got pensioners and some other, you know, groups. The employee household component, their their cost of living went up. Um, I think it was at nine percent, or just over nine percent, in the year of September. So that was against a CPI increase of. Uh, I'm just testing my memory here, but we're around five and a half percent, or close to six percent. So the reason for that is because obviously employer households, um, you know, pay mortgages and they pay rents, mm. and those two things are uh, well, mortgage uh, repayments are excluded from the CPI basket. And rents are, I'd argue, underweighted. And so the actual, you know, when, when, when you um, measure things that actual employee households pay, which is mortgages and rents and all the other stuff, the cost of it, the cost of living has gone up a lot, lot more than the inflation rate. Um, 
by contrast, if you're an older Australian who owns your home outright and doesn't have to pay mortgage rates or rents, your cost of living is less than the inflation rate, more, more than likely. So, you know, there, there's um, it all depends on your personal circumstances. Yeah, of course, it's um, very important to understand that the CPI is a very rough estimate. Interestingly, in, in the UK, they actually have CPIH, which includes the housing component as, as another metric. But what they do is they cherry pick which CPI metric they use based on whether they're trying to actually, um, uh, you know, keep the contained CPI rate as low as possible for sort of uplifting pensions and things, or whether it's uh, other ones for other purposes. So it's like, <laughs> we'll have a number for each thing we ever want to do. Chicken and stats, they call that, if you're, if you're a fan of the wire, you know. <laughs> So there you go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, the other thing, of course, is, you know, you mentioned some of those externalities. It's worth reflecting. Oil prices are now up at over 80 US and uh, continuing to rise a little bit. Um, some people are now saying, well, maybe we'll see them rise up to, to 100. And the shipping costs, the shipping costs have gone up about four times from where they were at their low point. And that's because ships are out of position. They're taking longer to get from A to B because they can't go through the um, you know, the Suez. And the, by the way, the Panama is also um, uh, struggling yeah, with capacity because of the, the, the lack of water. Um, so that means that some of the um, goods... Never ends, does it? Never ends. <laughs> it's all, there's always more to sort of to, to yeah, factor in. So, there's always a fly in the ointment somewhere. <laughs> Well, I guess it, it sort of indicates some of the sort of the externalities and uncertainties. And obviously, we've got the, you know, the, the conflict in the in, in, in and around the Middle East, which seems to be going, you know, a bad way and uh, and elsewhere, too. Um, so I guess the question is, um, you know, are those externalities, as you, you said, doesn't really move the needle yet? Um, I've seen a few people suggest they could. Well, they could yeah. And yeah. so. If I was a central banker and I was thinking about, um, you know, tackling inflation, they tend to look just at the, what's happened. But should they also be taking account of what might happen as well? Yeah, they should. They should. But at the same time, um, you know, I mean, I, look, look, I suppose they can the, – the problem with doing that is they could easily be wrong as well. So they, I think they need to look at the – follow the data um, first and foremost. And if they try and speculate that this could happen and doesn't happen, well, then, you know, they – they create problems for himself there. So, um, you know, we saw that we saw that pretty much the whole last decade, where the central banks kept on predicting that wages were going to, you know, rocket. Um, you know, we saw how wrong their wage inflation forecasts were for a decade. Uh, I remember that funny hockey stick where they got like the wage forecast is here, and the next year is here, and it's going to keep doing this, <laughs> and then it kept, the actual wages kept going like that. Um, so yeah, they always run the risk of that. Um, you know, yeah, we'll see, we'll see how it plays out. I mean, I'm, I'm still hopeful that uh, that inflation, you know, continues to moderate and sort of, you know, gradually returns back to their target. Um, but, you know, <laughs> we, could, we could just as easily say, I mean, I think we are sort of in a kind of period of stagflation anyway. We've got, we've got piss poor growth, let's face it. Yep. If you, if you, uh, you know, take our population growth through a per capita recession, we have been for quarters, for three quarters straight, uh, Canada's the same. Canada's in a deep per capita recession. New Zealand, um, you know, various other uh, countries elsewhere. Um, yet they got this highish inflation. So it's kind of, we, we are already in a sort of effective stagflation period. Um, and also low productivity growth pretty much everywhere as well, which is, you know, a sign of stagflation. So, um, yeah, we, are, we have got a, you know, it's not saying it's as bad as 1970s stagflation, but, it, yeah, we do have a moderate version of, well, a, a form of stagflation at the moment. So, um, and, and, I, and I said, I remember I wrote, I wrote a piece before COVID hit um, that I wrote a Christmas report, special report. Maybe it was just the first year of COVID. I can't remember. Um, yeah, I think it was 2019, actually, December 2019, saying that Australia is, because we're finishing that decade, and I said Australia risks another lost decade. Um, no, sorry, it must have been the first year of COVID. The reason why was at the time we had negative net overseas migration. I said, if the federal government goes back to its same policy of just juicing population growth, we're going to have another lost decade because, uh, you know, which is basically we have really poor per capita GDP growth where it's almost, you know, close to zero. Um, you have very, very poor income growth close to zero, which is what we had pretty much last decade. And I basically said we're just... Where, where I, I think it was called sowing the seeds of another lost decade. And unfortunately, three or four years later, or whatever it is, it looks like we're doing exactly that. And if anything, this decade shaped up to worse than the last decade, which sucked, which, which, which at macro business we called a lost decade. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's just another, 
Um, looks like it's shaping to be another decade where we get headline growth just because we're bringing in tons of people. But per, per, per capita outcomes keep going backwards once you adjust for all the quality of life indicators. And that's pretty much, you know, we're repeating the similar mistakes to what we did last decade. Um, you know, obviously the circumstances are slightly different, but the broad macro drivers or the policies that the federal government's pursuing are very similar. Just bringing tons of people, generate top-line growth, um, don't build enough houses, don't build enough infrastructure, really poor productivity, and just watch living standards slide backwards. And, you know, really poor uh, wage growth as well, uh, or, you know, income growth. And that's effectively what we got. So, um, yeah, uru. <laughs> Well, yes, and, and you know this has been a long-term set of trends, right? So, effectively, we pile more people in. We pile more people in, it makes the um, the top line number look okay-ish, not great, but okay-ish. I guess the other externality we should talk about is um, is um, what's happened up in China with regard to <laughs> the collapse of uh, you know who. Um, finally, after two years, and uh, the implications of that could be quite significant too in terms of um, steel demand and all those sorts of things. Because, of course, if you think of the Australian economy, we always say houses and holes, right? Um, well, houses is the you know the big the, the, the big thing, but also digging stuff up and chucking it overseas is the other big thing. A lot of that's going to China if, in fact, demand for steel. Um, continues to uh, perhaps ease back, that could have a big impact on the on the revenue line of the um, of, of the Australian economy as well. So even if they um, continue to pump the population, um, which means per capita growth goes um, you know backwards, top line growth is also at risk potentially. Yeah, and uh, and obviously you know if, if China's demand for uh, for steel, yeah, basically for iron ore and coking coal, uh, effectively which is steel demand. Um, you know, falls because they're obviously not building as much stuff. And let's face it, China's economy has been, uh, Jim Chenos called, I think, all the way back in 2008. He basically mm-hmm. said this this is unsustainable. But obviously, you can, you know, they've run it for another 15 years since then. Um, I think it was 2008, roughly around that time. Um, you know, Jim Chenos has come out saying China's building empty cities and it's got this really, you know, poor, um, you know, growth model, which is just unsustainable. Well, Nearly, you know, fifteen years later, it looks like it's finally might be coming a cropper. Like they're going, to, they're probably going to keep trying to keep, you know, keep it going for longer because they, that's what they do. But, um, but, but ultimately, you know, this this was always going to happen at some point where their demand for just building stuff for the sake of building stuff to keep the economy going, is, you know, was always going to fail at some point uh, or at least slow down. And then once that happens, Australia was always in the, you know, in in the uh, in the sights because, um, you know, we're a massive uh, iron ore and coking coal um, supply to China, where they're, where they're biggest. And yep. um, obviously, if their demand falls, well, then those prices fall in the global market. And we, and you know, Rio, Rio BHP and all the uh, Fortescue, et cetera, all take a hit. And um, that means less budget revenue for the federal government as well, because through company taxes, even though we don't tax that stuff nearly enough, <laughs> uh, it's, we still do get tax, uh, you know, a fair bit of tax from it just through corporate taxes. So, you know, so yeah, that, that'll filter through. And of course, Australia runs the dumbest economic model ever. We just bring where you know why resource-rich countries like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand run high population. Well, sorry, New Zealand's not resource-rich, but they are you know a primary producer. But yeah, I should say Canada and Australia run high immigration programs is beyond me. Um, both nations sit on masses of mineral wealth, which is basically one of the primary reasons why both countries are rich, and yet we run policies that deliberately dilute that wealth amongst more people. Um, At the same time, we don't tax those things properly. So we don't, the people that live here don't get enough of the benefit from it. So, you know, you can't think of a worse economic model. Can you imagine Norway was doing this stuff? They weren't taxing their resources and they were, you know, pumping their population so that those resources got spread more thinner. It'd be, it's it's madness, but uh, that's what we do. And I I think I bring this up just about every time on this show, Martin, and there you go. That's my little... uh, Little rant on that topic for today. I can keep no, going, but you know, no, 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 no. This is I a mean, little bit. We, we, we are on the same on the same page here. It's a it's a really dumb strategy. And if you compare Norway, of course, they just announced that their um that you know that investment fund which they built years ago. True. Yeah, it, yeah, and they're now investing big in um, AI, and uh, you know they've got increased the holdings of Microsoft, etc., etc. And it's huge. No, they, 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 it's it's like worth. Um, I think it's too true. It's about three hundred thousand dollars per citizen. I, yeah. I tried to do the cal- Unfortunately, I think that's right because when I was trying to do the, I put in my calculator and it's like, how do you even put two trillion 
into the cath and I was trying to count the zeros. I'm like, hang on, is it nine, ten? I couldn't work out any zeros, but it, I'm pretty sure it's about three hundred thousand dollars per uh, per resident in Norway. They got about five million people, or well, five point six, I think. Um, so it turns out to be about three hundred thousand. I'm pretty sure uh, dollars per um, citizen that sovereign wealth fund, and they're smart and they don't domestic, they don't invest it domestically because if they did that. Um, you know, if they invested that domestically, that'd pump up their exchange rate and then it'd make them uncompetitive and to sell, you know. So instead they invest it all offshore, um, which keeps their exchange rate uh, lower and then that makes them more competitive as well. So, yeah, they're, pretty, yeah, they're smart. They've, they've done the right thing and they don't, you know, Norway's population has grown by about 25% since 1960. Ours has grown by 170. So um, it's just moronic. And uh, the viewers probably may or may not know that Australia's population ticked over to 27 million last week, mm. according to the, Australian, uh, the ABS's population clock. Now, what that means is that this century, the population has grown by 8.1 million people in it, just 23 years. 19 years early. 19 years early compared with No, it's, mate, it's actually it's more than that. It's um, Well, I think we hit 27 million. It's like 30-odd years early. Yeah. Um, based on the uh, – so in 2002, the first inaugural uh, intergenerational report was right. released. And, and, that, and that tip that, um, you know, Australia wouldn't hit 25 million for – oh, geez, when was it? It's like it's, – it's decades away from now. That's 25 million, let alone 27. And that was based on, um, on net overseas migration and 90 th- – well, projected – of 90,000 per year, which was basically the historical average up to that point. And then the Howard government started this rot because he, um, he he held a, a massive, you know, parliamentary inquiry into Australia's skills. And um, that was that basically the Business Council of Australia, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry and Australian Industry Group all attended and they basically said, we've got massive skills shortages in Australia and we need to solve them. And one of the ways to solve them is we need more immigration. So the Howard government obliged, thanks to you know my mate Abel Rizvi, uh, you know who, who devised this stupid program that we've got, um, and he basically yeah he he ramped immigration, and in the fifteen years leading up to COVID, we went from ninety thousand, what was the projection, and sort of the historical average, up to two hundred and twenty for that fifteen years, and then obviously the pandemic hit, and now we're at. We had 518,000 last year. So, you know, because we had to make up that lost migration, Martin. You know, we had to make up. Uh, we couldn't possibly have, you know, <laughs> slower migration for a few years, you know, because 220 suddenly the became the figure we had to meet no matter what. And uh, and, and now the intergenerational report tips um, 235,000 forever and a, straight, and a population going to 40,000. 40, oh, sorry, 40, 40, 40 and a half million by yeah. 2063. So, you know, it's just... It's crazy. This, this is what we've done. It's been deliberate. And uh, yeah, 8.1 thousand, sorry, million people in this century alone. And that's why we've got a rental crisis. That's why we don't have enough infrastructure. That's why our water, well, it's one of the reasons why our water supplies are structurally, you know, undersupplied because, um, you know, effectively we've got 8.1 million mouths that need water <laughs> and all the other stuff that goes with it. You know, it's just crazy. And then this whole, uh, don't, don't, don't give me this net zero stuff. Like, how are we going to meet that with this population growth? It doesn't seem possible to me. If you grow your number of consumers, you're going to have more energy users and you're going to use more energy and you're going to have more emissions. Like, it's just logic. So uh, anyway, I, 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 I pretty much get in this topic every time I come on this show. I can't help it, guys. I'm sorry. Well, it's because it's, it, it's absolutely a centre point, isn't it, of, of the whole... Australian story, you know, which is, which is, well, how do you grow the economy? Well, you just bring more people in, et cetera, et cetera. It's interesting that Robbie Barwick um, made a comment um, while you were talking about China and said, the empty cities are now full and the Chinese government did what the Australian government would never do, which is to deliberately take steps to deflate the property um, market. So that's a property bubble, he called it. Now, that's an interesting observation. Certainly in Australia, the last thing that anybody wants to do is to actually allow property prices to fall. Well, yeah, we, 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 so, so China's done the old build it and they'll come approach. We do the let them come and then don't build it. So, <laughs> and, 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 and my mates at the, my, my mates at the Grattan Institute, the, uh, the, the immigration shuls over there, uh, sponsored by Peter Scanlon, mm. um, 
you know, they they did an article. I haven't written it up yet. I'm going to do it for tomorrow. But um, they wrote an article in the conversation saying, oh, we need to, the solution to the housing shortage is to bring in migrant construction workers now. Hmm. It's like, bloody <laughs> hell. Recurs- you know, recursive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, okay, we need ha- migrants to build houses for migrants. Yeah, yeah. good one, guys. Yeah. Like, like they, they can never admit that it's they're wrong and that the system doesn't work. The solution to the problem is always the thing that's caused the problem. Hmm. Um, you know, it just cannot. It just does my head in. But anyway, that's the way it goes. Um, you know, it, 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 it's the it's not going to change. It's just, the system's not going to change. I wish I wish it would, but I, don't, I can't see it changing. Hmm. Well, and, and that is really the point that um, you know there is a there is a long story here, right? Of of continued policy in a particular direction, either side of politics. So it doesn't matter who's in, right? It, it's the same. And, uh, you know, I think we've discussed before about the way that Treasury thinks about all of this and the fact that Treasury often calls the shots, whoever is in power, uh, when it comes to some of these policy um, metrics. Because, of course, they're measuring top-line GDP growth. And, uh, well, you know, get you more people, you get more GDP. But it doesn't actually make life better for anybody, uh, nor does it actually really um, take the economy to where it needs to be Reduces manufacturing. You know, we're still seeing that at the moment. Um, less manufacturing than ever before. And, um, well, you've got to ask the question then, well, it is a self-replicating thing that says build more property, bring more people in, build more property. <laughs> That's oh, it. No, no. But, but you're missing a key ingredient, selling coffees as well. <laughs> oh, I forgot that one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got to sell them coffees too because you you've got to have even small cafes because you don't have enough of them. Um, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, like they're – so I live in a suburb called Ashburn, really nice suburb, Melbourne. And we've got a local strip shops called uh, High Street, which is, you know, it's one of the it's one of the few places in Melbourne that has a proper old-fashioned strip shop. Like, it's really good. And uh, probably, <laughs> but you go down there now. So when I moved here in 2006, there was like maybe three cafes in the whole strip. Now I reckon there's at least 15. There might be 20. Like, it's just insane. It's like... And most of them are empty. There's a couple that always, you know, outperform, and they're, they're the cool places, right? Which most most dorks go to. I, I don't buy coffee out if I can afford it because I think it's a rip off. But um, you know, but they're, they're the ones that most most of the cats go to. And the rest of them are just basically struggle to get by. And it's like, why do we need a dozen, maybe fifteen coffee shops in a strip? And then and then it's the same with personal training studios. So it's like there's a whole bunch. There's one here, 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 here. You know, half of them shut down. Then another one opens up, and then they shut down because they, you know, they can't make money. Um, and then, and then the biggest one in the last, and I understand, I still don't understand this economy. I reckon it's money laundering and other nefarious things. We've got now massage parlors. Like the every strip shop in Melbourne now is probably three of those. And you're going, where the hell goes with these things? Um, you know, but yeah, it's just, is that what you want to build your economy on? Is all this stuff, which. Everyone who works in those things struggle to make ends meet. And shouldn't they be doing something else? Like, shouldn't we do doing something productive uh, instead of just having all these, you know, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not having to go to someone who runs a cafe. Like, it's, it'd be hard work and everything. But I'm just saying, why do you need 12 of them? Like, wouldn't, wouldn't we be better off having four cafes that are all healthy and make a profit rather than 12 where you got two that do okay and the rest struggle? Um, but that's, you know, pretty much the Melbourne economy. It's just, uh, yeah, this kind of, it's just based on bringing in people and more people and more volume and more meat for the grinder. That's that. That's kind of the, the economy down here. We don't really have a real economy. And then we've got a massive bloated public service as well, which, you know, just is highly inefficient. Um, you know, and we can't build any bloody infrastructure for a decent price because we've got all the, you know, all, all the cronies in on that as well. So it's just, um, yeah, it, it makes you a little bit negative, a uh, bit pessimistic about the future, I'll be quite honest. Yeah, and I guess, you know, you could think about it in the old theory of the economy is you have, you know, the dollar that goes around the system, right? So effectively, if you have, uh, you know, that same dollar going around the system, but it's not multiplying, it's just the same dollar going around the system. It, that's one of the reasons why productivity is is so, is so limited. And of course, the other factor is we've got um, a lot of people working in the caring sector, which is a critical, critical sector. But again, that doesn't actually necessarily create more momentum in the economy. So if you look at the growth engine in the economy, it's getting narrower and narrower and spluttering along. Um, and, and it's not just us, Martin. It's, mm. So there's a, you know, it's been really good. So I think Canadians are a bit more honest than us in a lot of ways. Uh, look, I don't know. I've I met Canadians, obviously. I've never been over there. But 
I do read their press a bit like I follow New Zealand. And their bank economists now and other economists are now pushing back hard against their government's extreme immigration. So, mm. you know, if you think Australia's immigration is high, Canada says, hold my beer. <laughs> um, and if you don't, actually, I might, I've, I've actually got the, the article I put up today. I might share my screen. Just, you know, we all know it. Record 500 and nearly 20,000 people last financial year. Off the charts. Never seen it anywhere, anywhere near it before. Um, unbelievable. That's obviously, it's actually worse than this. But I'll just grab Shane Oliver's chart because it has fakesy rate and uh, rents on one chart. I don't know where he's got the data from, but you get the idea. Population skyrocket, rents are skyrocket, vacancy rates down. Um, you know, usual story. And in, in Australia, we've got per capita recession where GDP per capita is lower than it was, you know, in 2021, effectively. And while aggregate GDP has grown because we've had this, you know, we've got uh, massive population growth. But, you know, per capita, we're bad. Now, this is Canada. So th this is from the National um, Bank of Canada. So th these guys wrote this fantastic report earlier in the month saying that Canada is trapped in a population trap that it's basically cannot get out of because its population is growing too fast, to, faster than business investment, housing, infrastructure, and they're getting effectively what's called capital shallowing, which is when basically you spread all those three things across more people, you get lower productivity and lower living standards. Exactly what we've got in Australia. And here's a classic chart where basically Canada's had this unbelievable population boom out of 1.2 million people uh, versus uh, 620 last year, so basically double R's. And they're not double the size. They're about 40 million people um, versus our 27. But yeah, you know, similar kind of magnitudes. And CPI rents rocketed. So our CPI rent actually looks pretty similar to that because ours is rocketed as well and still catching up to asking rents. And then yeah, the, the housing supply, shit, shock horror, massive supply deficit because the housing hasn't kept up, right? So surprise, surprise, housing shortage, massive rental growth, just like Australia. Oh, living standards at a standstill. That's Canadian GDP per capita. Absolutely shit ass. Sorry, I shouldn't swear in this program. Absolutely terrible. Versus US. Um, this is the this is the key one. Um, th now, this is basically the whole thing. This is their capital shallowing. So this is their real capital stock per person collapsed because basically the number of people they've got is growing faster than their business investment, infrastructure, housing, etc. So they're getting capital shelling. So Canada's productivity sucks, just like ours, which is why no reason why their GDP per capita is crashing. Um, you know, and then this is their non-residential capital stock per capita. That's so it's gone from here, 2014, to here. It's falling. And then Jared Minak is a is a gun economist in Australia. He put out a report about a month ago, oh, November actually, where he basically came, it was basically a mirror image of this report, but on Australia. And he this is his start of the his chart of Australia's um, capital shallowing. So cap capital stock per person crashed, just as GDP per hour works crashed as well. So you know we've got similar economies here, where basically the both governments Trudeau, Albo here, but also it started before Albo. Let's face it, this has been going on for years. Um, you know they're just running this population Ponzi economy, where the whole thing is just bring people in and then worry about. Well, don't worry about it, but. Let, let everything else rip and suffer. So let business investment not keep up. Let housing not keep up. Let infrastructure not keep up. And what it basically means is you end up with falling productivity and falling, you know, um, falling, you know, capital shallow because you get capital shallow and you got less, less of that stuff to spread around. And then you end up with lower living standards and obviously higher rents and all this other stuff. And, and um, you know, Jared, this is Jared Minak's uh, conclusion, basically, after that chart, where he says, basically, Australia's economic performance. This is why I said, why I used the, the lost decade meme. Like, I, I was saying this, you know, well before he wrote this report, but that, that, that last decade was basically a lost decade for Australia. And he just said, basically, it was the, before the pandemic, it was the worst in 60 years. Um, you know, GD, per capita GDP growth was low, productivity growth tepid, real wages were just stagnant, and housing increasingly unaffordable. Um, and according to him, this is Jared Minnick, there were many reasons for the mess, but the most important was a giant capital to labour switch. Australia relied on increasing labour supply rather than increasing investment to drive growth. 
And he said it was basically a demonstrable failure in the 15 years that led up to the pandemic. And remarkably, the country is doubling down on that exchange strategy. And the result's going to be just as poor, if not worse. Now, this is everything I've been saying for 10 years of macro business and ignored by, not, not, not by viewers here, but you know, ignored by the mainstream. I'm starting to get my comeuppance now because I'm now getting called on the radio and everything else. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so I'm now I'm now doing all that. You know, I'm getting it. Uh, they're all sort of taking notice now, which is great. But you know, this is this is just it's it's great to actually have another economist come out independently and come up the same conclusions that I've had for years. And you know, you sort of feel like, oh, good. You know, I'm not I'm not the only one who thinks this stuff. Mm. Um, but this is a highly, highly, highly damage, damaging, um, you know, uh, 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 growth model that we're running. And Canada, and for Canada as well, it's highly damaging for them too. It's absolutely ridiculous. But, um, you know, we've got these, got these nutters in government that are prepared to continue doing it. And we get gaslighted by politicians who seem to say that it's the solution to the problem rather than the creation of the problem. And if you add on to that, you know, KPMG came out and, and said, no, 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 we just got to keep growing, right? And, and then when you actually think about it, well, you know, who does it benefit? It benefits the banks because they can lend more. It benefits the um, the big construction companies because they can build more. Um, you know, the retailers can sell more. So actually, big Australia, from a, from a corporate perspective, sponsors and wants this perpetual population growth. But it's oh, it, yeah. unsustainable. Hundred percent. Look at look. It's you know it's the same old story. The growth lobby loves it. They make more, uh, you know, more customers to sell to. If you're if you're high rise Harry Triggerboff, who's you know who makes your money selling apartments and land banking, and then watching the land values go up, mm. um, you know, banking apartments and banking land, you love population growth. That's why you were saying Australia needs to be should be hundred million people because it benefits you. Uh, same if you're a bank. If you're a bank, you've got more people to lend to. Um, you know, Harvey Norman, uh, Jerry Harvey used to pump big Australia as well. He loves it because more people means more customers to sell, you know, goods to his, uh, his household appliances and everything. So for them, it's a win-win. Uh, it also means they can, you know, keep downward pressure on wages in some areas because they, they've always got this endless, you know, contestable labour market where they can just bring people in overseas. And, um, you know, well, and they don't have to train people here. Like, why would you bother training a local when you can just go and bring in a migrant? Um, you know, and it, 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 it's not the sole co- cause of our problem. Of course it's not. And people sort of think, oh, well, you're, you're a one-trip pony leaf because that's all you ever talk about. It's like, no, I talk about it because no one else talks about it. Um, I don't need to talk about things that we all know is wrong. Um, but this is one thing where there's so many shills pushing for it that there needs to be a voice pushing against it. And I'm the antidote to that. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Um, that's why I do it. But um you know, it's it's just crazy, and and, and look look look, we've seen we've, we've seen this sort of per capita recession bear out. If it, can I share the screen again, Martin? I'll just yeah, uh, I've got go some other um, charts I've done. I'll just just shout okay, out to so, Tony Lacandro who's just uh, dropped in. Hi, Tony. Good to see you. G'day, Tony. How's things? Um, yeah. So talking about this, you know, absolute uh, per capita recession or whatever. You know, households getting smashed. Real household disposable income, which is here, um, has collapsed. It's basically running at levels we have uh, running similar, basically almost the same, like it's slightly you know, a rounding error bigger than what it was in 2012. Mm. So we've effectively given, or maybe it was 2011, I can't remember, 2011 and 2012, we've basically given up 12 or 13 years of gains uh, in the last you know couple of years. Um, so we got all the, the big boost from the stimulus, and then that's, that's all gone and we're down to basically... 2011 or 12 levels. You know, it's absolutely, and, and you know, according to Michael Reed at the AFR, this is so this data is to, to September, but he did analysis to June, so the June national accounts, and showed that Australia had the biggest fall in disposable income per capita in the world uh, in the year to June, and obviously real wages have tanked as well. So you know, we, we, we're um, and obviously this chart, uh, which is similar to the other one, shows that we've been in per capita recession. Uh, for several years, you know, growing in aggregate because of population growth, um, but households are getting smashed. So we've we've basically um, households lost six percent of their income last year per capita in real terms, but their real spending only fell by one point eight percent in the over the same period. And the reason for that 
their real uh, their, their real household consumption. The reasons the difference between there is because they drew down the savings, so they basically created the savings rate to the lowest level since the G- GFC. They're basically drawing down the savings to keep this level higher than it would be given the falling consumption. And today we actually got um, you know real retail sales. Oh, sorry, nominal retail sales figures. Um, for the year to December. And what it showed is that nominal retail sales only grew by 0.8% last year, the last calendar year. Now, when you factor in the fact that um, inflation was about, what, 4.8% or something, 4.6%, uh, according to the monthly CPI indicator, and we had 2.4% population growth, that means we went back backwards by about 6%. So real retail sales per capita fell by about 6%, which is similar to what the household disposable income fell by. And all it sort of tells you is that households are getting absolutely smashed and they're, um, they're cutting back. And the only thing papering over the economy's cracks is we're adding more households. So the you know households are cutting back individually, but we're adding more households than households are cutting back. And that's what's keeping this aggregate growth going up. Like That's why the economy is still growing, even though per capita we're not growing. So it's absolutely terrible for living standards, but the government can say, hey, look, we're not in recession, we avoided recession because they're basically running this population Ponzi scheme. And, you know, I don't know about you, but it's not exactly a, you know, a great model because politicians should be care, should care about living standards. They shouldn't care about what the aggregate GDP is saying. Who cares? It doesn't matter. It's what everyone's slice of the pie is. Um, you know, in fact, it's actually broader than GDP. GDP on its own is not a great measure, but, you know, I'm just saying, like the, the measures that politicians should look at should be per capita outcomes, not aggregate outcomes, because aggregate means nothing. Mm. You know, it, it, it's pointless. Like, why do you care if the overall economy grows by X, if it's done that because you've grown the population by X plus, you know, one, whatever? It doesn't It doesn't matter. Um, but, you know, they're the sort of traitorous leaders that are, uh, that, that, that lead us. And unfortunately, you know, the, most of the mainstream media and, um, you know, a lot of economists in the country, uh, you know, worship aggregate GDP rather than per capita and living standards, which is what I focus on and what I care about. Yeah, and of course, a lot of the uh, mainstream economists also just focus on the GDP number and, uh, you know, yep. like Gerard and yourself and a few others who, who are really call it out as it is. I think the other you should talk- say, look, look, why are we doing this? They, they, yeah. they look and go, well, what's yeah. the point of this? Like, what's, the, what's the end point for this? Yeah. Yeah, well, what is the end game? The end game is uh, lower quality of life, less... Um, ability for households to spend. Um, probably you'll see that um, you know death rates will continue to sort of drop rather than rise because we can't afford to spend as much as we need on health and everything else. Because of course, infrastructure includes things like health and uh, education and all those other critical capabilities that are required. But nobody thinks about. It. And if you compare that, interestingly, if you compare what's going on now with what happened post-war. There was a significant boom in the population then, a significant boom in building, but it was planned and they put the infrastructure in place as well. Yeah, and they also had, um, I mean, obviously it's a lot easier to, so it's a lot easier for somewhere like Canberra to add, you know, X number of people than it is for say, um, so basically the smaller you are and you got, you don't have to go as far from the city centre. Hmm. You can add, you can sprawl pretty easily because it's still not that far to the city centre, et cetera. But as you get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, bigger it becomes, you know, untenable, which is effectively what we've got now. And there's there's some studies out there which basically say that, you know, um, that the optimal size of – well, in fact, the, there's a guy called uh, Peter McDonald who's a demographer, and he used to be really good, and then he turned into immigration shield. But he, he did um, – he, he's from ANU. Um, anyway, he, he did make a comment a couple of years back where he, I think he might be retired now because I haven't heard from him for a few years. He used to be all over, you know. Um, but he basically said that, you know, once cities get over 5 million people, they tend to, you know, um, their, their living standards fall was basically his general rule of thumb. And, you know, like like below 5 million, um, you know, they, 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 they become over their optimal size, generally speaking. And that's basically where Sydney and Melbourne are. I mean, I'd argue they're over a optimal size probably million million people ago. Um, but you know, you sort of get you sort of get the idea. Like this perpetual growth thing, where whereby Sydney and Melbourne are projected to be about nine 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 or ten million people by twenty sixty, it's just nuts. When you think that Melbourne at the turn of the century was three point three million and Sydney was about three point seven, it's just like, why do we? You know, why is that good to? 
effectively triple the size of your cities almost in about 60 years. It just doesn't make sense to me. So, um, but that's all they do. Yeah. Well, it's some um, uh, rather naive but simple policy, isn't it? That's the problem. Now, just come back to the retail sales. It's worth just uh, underscoring one other critical thing. Of course, if you look at the value and volume, right, the, the fact is that because the cost of everything has gone up, people are having to spend more to buy the same things that they bought previously. And I think sometimes the um, the way the ABS reports the numbers, it doesn't make it that absolutely crystal clear about the difference between value and volume over time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, so, that, so that monthly retail sales data is just basically the, the nominal value. So mm. like, um, so that, that's obviously impacted by inflation, which has been high, and, uh, and also population growth. So once you strip those two things out, the sales are really poor, and they've been, you know, as I said, they've fallen about six percent last last uh, calendar year. So, um, you know, it's just another sign of a very, very weak economy where we've got this it's basically a per capita recession economy, um, which is the one we're in. And and it looks like this per capita recession is going to last, you know, most of this year at least, um, because you know the the Treasury's prop population growth forecast, and um, I might just put that on there quickly just to show everyone. So the uh, the overseas migration forecast. Mm. Uh, this is released in December from mm. on the MyEFA. And basically, so we hit 518,000 uh, last uh, financial year, so 2022-23, and they tipped that this financial year is going to come down to 375,000. So, you know, this is a, this is Labor's whole spin, like, we're cutting immigration, we're going to halve it back to 250 over, you know, X number of years, which is still ridiculously high and higher than we had, you know, higher than the average pre-pandemic. So, you know, we had the 15 years of Big Australia. Um, so, you know, 375 this financial year, according to them, that's still be the second highest level on record uh, in Australia's history, uh, down from last year's. Um, it looks like, it, you know, immigration is actually turning, turning over. So the monthly visa arrivals data, which the ABS publishes separately, but it correlates really strongly with net overseas migration. This chart's by Commonwealth Bank, by the way, Gareth Ed. Um, that started to fall. Uh, and the reason why it's falling is because on this chart here, we've got student visa arrivals have started to catch up to departures. So departures have slowed, but uh, sorry, arrivals have slowed, but departures have caught up. And the reason for that is obviously at the start of the pandemic, departures, you know, heaps of students went home. When the borders reopened, we had a whole bunch arrive, but there was none to go home because they'd already gone home. And then now they're starting to go, now we're starting to get outflows again. And that basically means that this 375,000 target looks real, well, not target, projection looks probably, you know, semi-real, yeah, you know, like fairly likely. But that's the sort of number we're going to get. Um, now, it's important to po point out that my EFO's current forecast is cumulatively, so over there, you know, six-year forecast, or whatever it is, 458,000 higher than what they projected in Labor's October 2022 budget. And, 30, and after Labor then ramped it up, in their um, May budget last year, it's still 38,000 higher than was forecast in the May federal budget. So the fact of the matter is that, um, you know, we're still stuck with high immigration. It's way higher than the budget, than the, than the government previously thought it was going to be when they decided to, you know, open, open the borders and basically try and get as many here as possible through all their various, you know, dukes of the, of the system. And, um, that's the primary reason why we've got a obviously a rental crisis. But what it also means is that, you know, the population grew by 2.4% in last financial year. It's probably going to come down to, you know, maybe 1.9%, 2%. But it's pretty much all the economic forecasts this year for the economy not to grow by that high, to grow by, you know, 1.2, 1.3, 1 1.4%, depending on who, who you are. So what that basically means is we're going to have another per capita, we're going to have another year of per capita recession. So we've already had three consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth in per capita terms, and we're likely to get several more quarters, which means that this will be this this will end up being a year and a half, maybe two year per capita recession, uh, which is, you know, a hell of a long time, mm. um, and it's probably it'll definitely be the longer, lot longest in my lifetime. Uh, so that's sort of the crappy economic outlook that we're facing. And the point here is. You've got to also think about the distributional impact of this, right? This doesn't mean that everybody is in that boat. What it means is there's actually a distribution element. So there are some who are doing relatively well, who's still getting quite high pay rises, 
There are others that are going backwards, and they've been going backwards since 2012. And unfortunately, there's quite a high correlation between those with large mortgages and those going backwards over a long period of time, particularly in some of those outer suburban areas. And so what you're starting to see now is, is, is a real disparity of um, you know, growth and income and prosperity in different areas across the country. Yeah, hundred percent. And and like I said before, and Terry's Terry's used this uh, term as well. Uh, I remember him saying he's spot on. There's basically three Australias right now. Mm. So you've got effectively, you know, one third of mortgage. It's not quite one third, but you know, close enough. Um, one third of people rent. One third of people, um, you know, have a mortgage, uh, own occupied mortgages. Should, should say. And then about one third of people own the homes outright and don't rent and don't have an unoccupied mortgage. And those people are basically killing it, creaming it. Uh, whereas the other two thirds, so those who are rent and those who, who have got mortgages are getting absolutely smashed. And uh, that reminds me, sorry, I've got to share a screen again. I'm, so this, so you might remember this, this is, mm. this is a few months old. This is probably from the, I think this is from the, uh, and I, actually it is the September quarter from the National Council, I'm pretty sure, or CBA's own data. What what the CBA did was they 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 measured spending per capita, and uh, also they had another one on uh, income per capita, which basically is a mirror image of this. And what it basically showed is that um, th this line here was the inflation rate in the September quarter, and what it showed is that older Australians, so those who were age seventy plus, were basically spending more than the inflation rate. So they had real spending; they were spend they, they were showing real spending growth. The younger Australians had outright falls in their spending. Right? That's because they tend to be, you know, the renters and whatever, and and or early mortgage holders have big mortgages um, because they got in the housing market uh, only a few years ago, et cetera, and they're carrying big loans. They're slashing their spending in in um, outright terms, let alone, you know, in real terms. So this is just outright spending cuts versus. And 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 this uh, the, these middle aged people who I'm, who I'm part of is basically spending less than the inflation rate. So they're spending uh, they're reducing their spending in real terms, but not in absolute terms. And that's the three Australians we've basically got here. Well, it's kind of a form of the three Australians. The older Australians killing it on average. I know there's obviously there's always people doing hard. Um, for example, if you're a, you know a, a renter and you're old, if you're one of those sort of twenty five percent, you're getting hammered. But on average. The older Australians, Australians who own most of the assets, they accumulate the most of the savings over the pandemic. Um, they tend to own the homes. Most of them own them outright. They might have an investment property or two with very small mortgage on it and they're getting the rents on that. They're doing very well. This mob's not doing as, you know, they're doing worse than, um, they're, they're in a per capita recession, I guess. And this mob are just in an outright bloody you know, financial disaster zone. And that's effectively the situation we've got with the three Australians. And, and you know, there's, there's massive distribution, distributional uh, consequences here because everyone's seen the stage three tax cut debate, right? Well, the share of personal income tax, uh, sorry, the share of income going in personal income taxes is hit in an all-time high. That's a chart I wish I'd, after just coming to this, I should have included in this, this slide, but mm -hmm. I forgot. Um, always happens. So basically... Australians are paying a record share of their income on, on income taxes right now. That's uh, seventeen point four percent. And even after the stage three tax cuts go through, CBA estimates that in a few years, like two years or something, um, we're going to be paying more than we do now in income tax, even with those tax cuts. And again, this older group here, who's absolutely killing it, are the ones who generally don't pay income tax. So they're getting a free ride on the on the tax front. All everyone, anyone here is working is getting absolutely hammered on their personal income taxes, getting hammered on their mortgages, getting hammered on their rents, and then obviously the general cost of living. Everyone, everyone suffers from from energy prices, etc. But this is where the whole distributional impact is is you know is um, is not being shared evenly. So whenever the RBA hikes interest rates, obviously it impacts. Roughly one third of people with unoccupied mortgages, um, they get they get hammered. We've got a mass population growth, which is pushing up rents, and we've got low housing supply because of various reasons. That's obviously hammering renters, and these guys are they're, 
this mob here are largely insulated. So it's a, you know, it's a bit of a crappy situation, but that's the way it is. Yeah, and it's also just, I think, um, uh, sort of thinking about this sort of slightly more broadly, and that is to say that the um, momentum that we're seeing here and the disparate distribution across different um, um, cohorts um, is likely to stay with us for quite some time because actually wages growth is coming down a little rather than going up unless you're in a very specific uh, area. So there isn't a get-out-of-jail card in terms of wages. And the other interesting observation, and I, I saw this uh, in a report uh, recently, that the banks at the moment are actually under huge margin compression because of the term funding facility going away and because of the international cost of funds much higher than they were. So their ability to be able to pass on rate cuts, even if rates cuts do come, are potentially um, you know, an issue. Um, so we might not actually see mortgage rates go down. They might rather keep those cheaper rates to attract new borrowers rather than existing borrowers. And then the other interesting observation is the investors who are piling back in at the moment are getting bigger tax breaks because the higher rates mean that they've got bigger tax offsets. So that's costing the Treasury a lot more than previously, right? So there's another factor in the mix as well. Oh, 100%. And, and look, you know, the, the unfortunately, the, the ATO tax, tax statistics take years to come out. They're always like two years behind. But I'm looking forward to seeing the, um, the tax statistics for this financial year. Uh, and last one, actually, uh, the last last financial year, this financial year, um, when they come out in a year and then two years' time from now, because they're going to be an absolute, like it'll be record negative gearing losses, which the government's going to have to absorb. Um, and, you know, for, for good reason, like the, the, despite the fact that rents have gone up a lot, they haven't gone up nearly as much as mortgage repayments have gone up. So mortgage payments have basically doubled, um, you know, since the RBA started hiking rates. And so mortgage interest is, is basically double. And, that, and, and that's the tax deductible bit. Yeah. And that just basically means that, you know, the uh, the Australian Treasury is going to be in for some pain. And and just to your point on um, on, on wages, uh, Martin, there's a, I'm pretty bearish on, on wage growth and there's a pretty good reason for it. And sorry, guys, I'm, I've got to do one more. We've had obviously this record population growth and the civilian population grew by, so this is, this isn't just from immigration. This is from immigration as well as with um, the civilian working age population. That's basically the population that's aged over 15 has gone up by more than immigration because baby uh, Costello's baby bonus kids um, from the early 2000s are now hitting working age. So they're sort of finishing uni they've or finishing school, university, et cetera. They're hitting the workforce. So we've had this sort of double whammy where we've got mass, pop, mass population growth through immigration and then we've also got this the baby bonus kids now hitting working age. And, and what that's meant is that the civilian working age population went up by, so this is population age over 15, went up by 643,000, 3% growth. Um, this is from this chart's from Alex Joyner at IFM, and this is based on the monthly labor force data. And so labor labor uh, labor supply is growing, you know, nearly twice the rate as it was pre-pandemic. And um this seek, as a result of that, we've got lower, um, we've also got obviously slowing economy. So job demand's falling. So according to SEEK, um, the number of job ads is almost down to it's basically uh, pre-pandemic level. It's almost there. It's fallen heavily because job demand's falling. At the same time, the number of applicants per job, and that's that's basically um, the combination, uh, so, sorry, at the same time, the number of applicants per job has rocketed and it's actually running well above pre-pandemic level. And that's because we've got more people, right? So you've got more people coming in looking for jobs. That's, living, that's driven the number of applicants per job. And the upside to that is that when you plot the ratio of applicants per job ad, which is this line here from Seek, it correlates. It's generally a pretty, it's been historically a pretty good leading indicator of the unemployment rate, you can see here. And this has spiked. It's gone through the roof. It's running so far above pre-pandemic levels now after rocketing. Combination of falling job demand, rising labour supply. And what that's pointing to is a pretty hefty rise in the unemployment rate. And Australia needs to create, this, this job's from CBA, sorry, uh, this chart's from CBA. Australia needs to create about 35,000 jobs a month just to keep the unemployment rate constant, assuming an unchanged participation rate. 
And that's a really high number of jobs that need to be created. It's, it's historically high. And if we don't do it, unemployment's going to rise, um, which, you know, based on this data seems inevitable. And when you have rising unemployment, it obviously means wage growth is going to fall because you're going to have more competition for jobs, um, you know, amongst workers and lower bargaining power. And it means that, you know, an oversupply of workers and that means that wage growth is going to fall. So I think that's a pretty good reason to be bearish on, um, uh, you know, bearish on the job market and also bearish on wages. And I'm, and I'm tipping that the unemployment rate, you know, we're getting pretty close to 5% by the end of the year. Um, whether it hits that or not, I don't know, but it'd be sort of, you know, up towards that, uh, 3.9% currently. Yeah, and the RBA some time ago said they expected the unemployment rate to rise a little and then sort of yeah, four and back and a half percent pedal, backpedal a little bit from that. But um, the expectation is probably higher unemployment. But, of course, the wages growth is is, is the first thing that happens. You know, if you can basically um, pick, your, pick from the market, you don't have to offer as much. The other interesting observation, and I think it came out quite recently, there was an interesting piece of analysis looking at the average wage of an overseas student working in Australia post versus a local That's one. In mate. fact, yeah, right. So there's it's a big terrible. gap there too, isn't it? So Mate, massive. No, another productivity um, problem. Yeah, hundred percent. It's a problem. Uh, mm. It's it's a so basically. Um, so th this is from the the Graduate Outcomes Survey. So the migration review that came out a few months ago, um, a guy called Tom Clennell at Sky News did a fantastic, uh, you know, fantastic analysis of it, and he basically said. He showed that just over half of international student graduates with a bachelor degree who've been here for three years are working in unskilled jobs. So it was like 52% or 53%. And what that means is they're living in, uh, they're working in uh, level four, or level five jobs. So what they basically do is level one's the high skill, level two, three, four, five is like bartenders, uh, cleaners, waiters, um, cafes, stuff like that. Um, so over half of our, uh, international student graduates who have a bachelor degree who've been here for three years are working in unskilled jobs. Let that sink in for a sec. This is supposed to be a skilled migration system, guys, <laughs> and they're working in unskilled jobs. What does that tell you? And then there's also the Graduate Outcomes Survey, which basically came out in uh, – gets released every year, but it's always you know, a year or two lagged in data. So the 2022 one showed that international student graduates, again, bachelors have been here for several years, earn 8,000 less than local graduates. They also have uh, lower labor force participation. They also have the lower share working in full-time jobs. So this whole notion that, you know, we're running this skilled migration program through the student migration channel is an absolute farce. It's skilled in name. You know, if someone comes out of a uni, uni with a spurious degree, well, that's supposedly skilled. But when you actually look at the outcomes, the outcomes are, are very poor. Mm. Um, they're earning, you know, a lot less than local graduates and they're a lot more un unemployed, underemployed. And, you know, if you've, when you've got over half working in unskilled jobs, like level four or level five jobs, that's absolutely shocking statistic, if you ask me. Um, you know, anyone who goes to university and does a bachelor degree and comes out and has been here for several years should not be working in an unskilled job. Well, not, not everyone, but most people. You know, like the overall majority should not be working unskilled jobs, yet over half working unskilled jobs. Mm. And that is an absolute farce. So it's another symptom of the, um, you know, high population input. A lot of students coming in, uh, a lot of them coming in, frankly, just to get um, citizenship or the equivalent of residential status rather than actually to um, train for... In fact, interesting in, in, in the recent um, Canadian situation, one of the leading politicians over there said, you know, if you look carefully, you've got more Uber drivers who are actually ex-graduates um, <laughs> than ever before, and they're all overseas. You know? So uh, no, it's, it's, it's look, happening there too. It sounds like a joke, but it's actually not. So yeah. it, uh, Engineers Australia um, has released several, you know, they, 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 they always say it's like they always put it down to some sort of racism, right? Mm. But they, they always say, oh, it's because employers don't employ them. It's like, come on, guys. So basically, 60% of engineers in Australia are foreign-born, foreign right? And according to Engineers Australia's own analysis, um, half of, of, 
overseas engineers working in Australia, so ones who are basically here as migrant, migrant engineers, I should say, uh, either un- underemployed, and they, and they actually use the term driving Ubers, like mm. in jobs like driving Ubers, yep. or unemployed. So what the hell are we doing here? We've got a situation, and, and, and the solution is always to bring more. I've got a shortage of engineers, we need to bring more. It's like, hang on, but half of them are working as bloody engineers. Like literally half aren't working as engineers, and they're underemployed, doing jobs, menial jobs like Uber or unemployed, according to Engineers Australia. So surely the solution is why, rather than bringing in more, there's obviously the system's broken. And I can use the same examples with accounting as well. Uh, you know, accounting is one of our biggest migrant sources. And even the Grattan Institute admits that accounting is an absolute rot. Uh, same, same sort of thing. Um, you know, so it's like, well, are we, come on, guys, are we really running a skilled system here? Like it's skilled in name, but it also ignores the fact that, you know, uh, 40% of the skilled migrant intake, the permanent skilled migrant intake we're talking about here, uh, is you now which is dominates the permanent migrant intake. In fact, I've got another I've got a chart here on that just to give you a bit. So as you can see, it's basically set at about 213,000 by memory. Uh, if you include the, there's, there's, there's like 3,000 Pacific Island um so we include the humanitarian intake and Pacific Island visas, which are basically permanent, but they don't count as in this intake, but they should. Um, but of that, the skilled migrant intake is about 130,000, right? This is a red line here. So you think, oh, gee, that's pretty good. That's a skilled system. So 130 out of uh, 213 is skilled. Problem is 40% of that skilled migrant intake are family members of the skilled migrant, and that's counted as skilled. And most of them, most of them are unskilled. So it's like, well, are we really running a skilled migration system? This is the permanent. This is not, this even looking at temporaries, which are mostly through the student migration channel. Yet, so we're always sold this, you know, baloney that Australia is running a skilled migration system when we set, you know, for the temporary sit, for the temporary migrant intake for a temporary skilled visa, we set the bloody base pay at $70,000, which is $15,000 less than the, than the median full time wage. So we set a skilled migration pay floor. That is well below the median, which includes unskilled workers. We we have a you know intake that's basically forty percent family members that are unskilled that are counted as skilled. The whole thing's a farce, you know. Like we 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 pretend to run a skilled migration system, but we don't do it. And it's one of the reasons why productivity sucks. Well, I've got permanent pills skill shortages here. Like Australia's population is growing by eight point one million people this century mm. because the Business Council. The Australian Industry Group, Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, lobbied the Howard government in 2002, saying we need to boost immigration because we've got a skill shortage. Well, shit. You know, we, we, we've grown the population by about 8 million since then, through primarily through immigration, so-called skilled, and our skill shortages are worse than ever. It tells you that the whole system's a farce. It's like a perpetual, you know, motion machine um, where you try, pretend to solve a problem, you bring in all these people and you make the bloody problem worse. Mm. And it's just, you know, so yeah, anyway, so a, a, a rant over. There's always <laughs> okay. a few of these conversations. Well, w- without wanting to echo Trump, if you were dictator for a day, right, in Australia, what are the two or three things that you would, would change immediately to try and actually reverse the trend or take Australia in a new, in a new direction? Okay. Number one, I'd boot out our, uh, I'd go to, I, I contact Norway and I'd say, all right, we want your best advisors of how to build a resource rents, you know, taxation system for resources, blah, 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 sovereign wealth fund, whatever. And I'd get them over and I'd let them devise this one. And I'd make that, I mean, dictate it for a day because the problem is the next day they just unwind whatever I did. But, <laughs> you know, so, so, so I guess, I guess my, my wish list, right? If, if I could do yep. it. So number one would be that. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd solve, you know, the whole BS that we've got where we've got basically multinational firms that basically get to pillage us for our resources, um, you know, and then charge us the into global prices on our gas, for example, and electricity, which then forces up electricity. So, like, why the hell? Yeah, with a Saudi Arabia of gas and we're paying bloody European prices, it's insane. Like, like you said last time, your energy bill was cheaper in the UK than Australia. Yeah. Like, what the actual, you know, what? It doesn't make sense. Like you imagine a Saudi Arabian paying two bucks a litre to fill up the car. It just doesn't make sense. That's basically what we do with our energy. So I'd, so I'd, I'd do that, number one, um, set up a sovereign 
wealth fund like Norway so we can actually get the benefit of it uh, and actually, you know, can cut income tax and all these other inefficient taxes and have more of that. And then you can, you've got more money to spend on social resources, et cetera, because we're taxing, like, you know, our, our exports of commodities are way higher than Norway's, but they capture theirs. We don't capture ours. Um, and obviously, number two to go along with that is I'd cut the hell out of the immigration program for starters. And I'd make sure that it's actually, you know, cut it down to about 100,000 a year. Um, you could cut the family stream from 50 at the moment down to 40 just purely by getting rid of parental visas. So we have this ridiculous system where we grant about 8,000 elderly parent visas a year, which according to the Productivity Commission costs Australia over their lifetime, uh, over their remaining life and they come here, $300,000 cost the taxpayer per visa that's granted. So it's an absolute drain. It ages the population and it's inequitable and it's completely ridiculous. Like, there's no magic putting in, in, in public finance. So if you're bringing in an elderly person from somewhere um, under the family, you know, this family scheme, and they're costing taxpayers $300,000 to, you know, over the remaining life, that's money you don't have to spend on schools, hospitals, and everything else. You've got to tax everyone at more. So I'd get rid of that system, and I'd make the remaining skilled part of it, like keep the humanitarian the same, whatever, but, um, you know, I'd keep the remaining skilled part of it very highly skilled. So none of this seventy thousand dollar wage floor thing. You set it at about one hundred and thirty, and you make sure it's only the highest skilled people, and you focus on areas that Australia actually doesn't have the capability here, rather than just, uh, you know, employ. It's easier for an employer to get that accountant or engineer from overseas and pay them seventy k, than it is to employ a local one for ninety, and have to train them, and then they end up work driving Ubers anyway, which is based on the system we've got now. Um, so yeah, that'd be number two. Um, number three, broad-based tax reform. You know, broaden the base, lower the rate, uh, lower you know the reliance on personal income taxes, all that stuff. Make it more efficient. Blah blah blah. Henry tax review stuff, which kind of segues back into number one. Like number one's a key component of that, and those are probably the three things I'd do. Um, you know, like property taxes, the whole thing, like just the whole, like basically get the Henry tax review and. And and you know implement a lot of those recommendations, like most mm-hmm. of them, and um, you know, but centred around number one, which was uh, tax our resources properly, um, make sure that domestic that domestic residents are looked after, and they're not paying these extreme prices that we that we that we're basically getting gouged, and that we actually get a fair return to taxpayers um, in the same way Norway does, and then put it away in a sovereign wealth fund, so we've got generational wealth. And basically, just copy Norway. So, so those would be the three things. And the, the thing about that, um, Leith, is those are all actually intensely doable if it wasn't for the political atmosphere that we're actually in, where neither side of politics wants to upset anybody. They don't want to do anything radical. And um, they're sort of just thinking very short term and, and thinking and, about. And beholden to vested interests. Yes, and I was going to say, I mean, we had Cameron on some time ago talking about, you know, the game of mates and how that all is part of the problem because, you know, th- this is not a, a pure pay financial or political discussion. It's actually also there's a dark shadow that, you know, the heavy hand of, of certain large players who can influence politicians and influence policy much more than individuals. Yeah, 100%. Unfortunately, uh, yeah. I mean, as I always say, like you know, the old uh, Don Thorn, Donald Thorn quote: "Australia's a um, was a lucky country run by I can't remember the term, like you know, substandard people or something like that. You know, <laughs> who, who, who share in its luck. So there's some some kind of quote like that. It's um, you know, it's not wrong. Like we've got all these natural advantages here, and we we're doing our best to complete completely stuff up. So um, you know, it's the way it goes." Mm, absolutely, but um, you know, it, it, it seems to me there's a, there's a vision question, and then there's about a well, what is the long term objective of what we're trying to achieve here, right? Because at the moment, all we're doing is we're swamping Australia with more people, and without putting the infrastructure in place, we're actually making the people already in Australia less affluent over time, not universally, but but. The, the bulk of them, and it's making it harder, and you know, the, the gradient to, to 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 live and thrive is actually becoming more difficult. You know, we're seeing tent cities and all those things. So, 
I, I'm just amazed that the um, the political environment is such that you know everybody just says, "Oh, that's just the way it is," and it moves on. Then talks about the same old, same old again. So we we need a, we need a different way of thinking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I, I do I do understand why some people just like roll their eyes because they feel like they feel helpless. Mm. You know what I mean? It's um, they sort of feel like, "Oh, look, look the system's never going to change." So you know, and, and and look, there is a there is a um, sometimes I feel jealous of people that are a bit uh, ignorant to all this sort of stuff because they're like, they don't have to worry about this stuff because you don't, you know, you know, you're not you're not aware of it, so you don't care about it. But when you when you sort of know how the sausage is made, uh, which you and I do after doing this for so long, um, you know, it, it, it can like I've kind of gone through the stages of grief, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so you know, I used to care more about it. I used to get really angry about it, and, and you know, be like typing like this. Now, sort of accepted it so i'm more chilled out about it all but and, and and it's almost become a bit more satirical now i guess the way i think about it like this is just a joke like <laughs> and sometimes i laugh like david i'm like can you believe this s-h-i-t you know like mm. yeah and um you know it's just but yeah it, it it never ceases to amaze you that you think you've hit rock bottom in terms of policy and, and then we just go further yeah. and i thought we hit rock bottom at five years ago oh, i can't get worse than this it gets worse <laughs> so um you know, it's just the way it is. But uh, anyway, you know, what do you do? Like, I'm not, um, I, don't, I, I don't stop at night, you know, getting stressed about this stuff anymore or get, you know, get too angry about it just because, you know, it's not good for your health. So, and plus, I guess I'm just getting a little bit more chilled out in my old age. <laughs> well, I mean, I think step one is to highlight the issues and keep highlighting them because, yeah. you know, you, you've done a great job with the migration. Because a couple of years ago, almost nobody was talking about the, 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 the risks of high migration and how stupid it is. But we've had, you know, people from the Australian, we've had uh, Minak, we've had other people now all, all, you know, talk about this stuff quite, you know, quite potently, I think. So I think that, that that's a good point. But I guess the other point here is that, um, um, you know, all of this stuff continues to grind and, and the cumulative impact on ordinary people are actually pretty negative. You know, you, you, you said they're being taken to the cleaners, and I agree, and I'm seeing that in my surveys too. So at some point, um, something will break, and I guess the question is, will it break in a way that actually then takes us to a better place, or will it break and then they'll just uh, reassert the same old, same old because the same political games will be played? I guess that's the open question. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm a bit pessimistic on that one. Like, if 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 the pandemic couldn't, uh, so I'm just obviously I'm going back to the migration. Thing. It's not just mm. that; it's all mm. other factors as well. But you would have thought when you have a effectively a forced two year freeze on migration, um, and you actually have a bit of negative migration for a bit, and all the opinion polls are saying people don't want it to come back, and you've already weaned it, weaned off the drug, right? It would have been very easy for the federal government just to do a moderate intake coming back. Like just go back to those historical levels, but instead they doubled down and they did the jobs and skills summit and they just basically ramped it up to levels we've never seen before. And it's deliberate. Like they can say, "Oh no, this is all just you know catch up, you know this whole catch up BS." But the fact of the matter is, the Albanese government came in despite promising to have lower immigration before they got elected. They came in and then immediately they spend this lie of we've got a one million visa backlog. Like what the hell does that even mean? Like a one million visa application sitting there. Well, it doesn't mean you've got to stamp them all. But his whole thing, we've got to get the visa backlog down. And then, um, you know, and then so they've just been, you know, rubber stamping everything. Uh, did the Jobs and Skills Summit where they loosened a whole bunch of stuff. Signed two Indian migration deals, which we still don't know the full impact, but they're obviously going to be positive for migration numbers. Um, and a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, they rubber stamped one. 100,000 pandemic event visas, which were meant to be temporary ones for the, over the pandemic for people who had to stay in Australia or whatever because they couldn't go home. And Labor just basically did another 100,000 after the pandemic was over. They did more than what the coalition did actually during the pandemic. So all this stuff has been deliberate. Yeah. And, um, you know, so if, if the pandemic couldn't kill this, you know, they, they had an easy way just to not go back to what they did before because they already weaned off the drug. Instead, they just went and took more drugs than ever uh, in terms of population growth. So, um, you know, that, that's why I don't have a lot of faith, because that was a great chance to reset it, reset it, reset the system, not mm -hmm. just in population, in a whole bunch of areas. Yep. And instead, they've just gone back to the old model and they've doubled down on it, just like Jared Minnick said. And we're going to get even worse results. And then we've just generated a rental crisis and a housing crisis. Um, you know, just on the housing thing quickly, if I don't, don't mind, Martin, like, you know, 
basically all the forward-looking indicators on housing are tracking at around decade levels. Now, I've got a chart. I'll just – so basically – what well, this chart is, it's got population growth in green, so it's 626,000, I think it was, uh, last financial year. And you got dwelling completion, uh, commencements, approvals, and completions. Completions are way below these two because there's just a whole bunch of unbuilt houses since the pandemic. Like there's heaps in my area, which are built because builders have gone bankrupt, whatever. There's just all these unfinished houses. So, But regardless, all three of these indicators are tracking around decade lows, right? levels we haven't seen for you know a decade. Um, at the same time, there's another chart I didn't bother putting on here, but it trust me, it's at almost an historical low, like record low. And that's loans for new homes, uh, according to the ABS. That's tracking it close to its lowest level in history. So all the forward-looking indicators are basically pointing to, you know, uh, worsening housing construction, housing supply. We only added 170,000 homes in 2022-23 or near to September against a population increase of 626,000, right? So we didn't build enough, clearly. And all the forward-looking indicators are suggesting it's going to get even worse. And most of that, you know, whether it's uh, Oxford Economics, uh, Housing Industry Association, Master Builders, they all think we're going to have even worse construction this year than we had last year. At the same time as the population growth, the uh, population is growing like a science experiment. And, you know, the Albanese government came out and said, oh, we're going to build 1.2 million homes over five years, 240,000 homes a year. We've never built over 223,000 in a single year ever. And that's and that was during, you know, when we did that, that was in about 2017 when we had the massive high-rise construction disaster centred on Sydney and Melbourne where we've had all these flammable cladding, cracking buildings, balcony leaks, um, you know, foundation problems, et cetera, Opal Towers, Mascot, a whole bunch of other ones, um, you know, costing owners tonnes of money. You've had to evacuate residents. You know, the building commissioner came out last week and said over half of all the apartments that were built between 2016 and 2022 have serious defects in them. And this brainiac of a federal government that we've, you know, prime minister we've got has said, you know what, there was such a success last decade when we built all these crappy apartments. How about we ramp immigration higher than ever, population growth higher than ever. We'll set a BS housing target that won't be met anyway. But if it does get met, it's going to be met by high-rise apartments because we're telling everyone they've got to live in high-rise now. And we're going to repeat the same building disaster that happened last decade, no, at the second half of last decade, when over five years we've built more apartments than we never built before and they're all terrible quality. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is you can't have quantity and quality at the same time. It doesn't work, right? But this idiot of a prime minister we've got who's decided to run a big migration, biggest migration program ever, basically means we have to build as many houses as we can as quickly as possible to try and meet that construction need. We won't do it because we can't possibly build that many, but, you know, he's going to, he wants to try. And all it means is we're going to just build with all these crappy high-rise apartments again, which are going to be very poorly built because we've had to build them so quickly and just slap them up quickly to, oh, shit, you know, we need, we need apartments. We need housing quick, guys. Just, just build something. It's going to be really poor quality. And we're going to basically repeat the same garbage that we did last decade where we had, um, you know, just faulty apartments, really poorly built, so overpriced, et cetera, and it still won't keep up the population growth they want to bring in. So it's just, you know, it's a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for falling living standards. It's complete BS. And that's what, you know, that's what they're doing to us. Absolutely. Jason, thanks for the super chat. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I agree, uh, Leith. And, and the problem is, of course, that um, the compounding effects of all these bad policies over year after year get worse and worse and worse. So that's one of the reasons why housing affordability is completely shot, why, in fact, productivity is falling through the floor. And, um, you know, the economic consequences of that also build and build and build. So it gets harder and harder and harder to, to, to come out with a nosedive. You just keep on doing the same thing because that's all you can do. And, and that's that, that seems to me where we are. Both sides of the politics pretty much um, singing from the same hymn sheet. So um, it, it's not a not a sunny outlook, unfortunately. And, um, you know, some of those externalities, as we discovered earlier on, um, you know, potentially ha might have an impact too. So economically, I think, um, you know, whether there's a recession formally or not, actually many households actually are behaving like there's a recession and that's not going to change yeah and, and and one of the problems also martin is that because this this malarkey has been going on for nearly 20 years 
Um, most young people, young people, I'm 46, right? So I remember how it was before. Um, you know, and you know, you're old enough to remember as well, and other people. But if you're fairly young, right? If you're, I don't know, 30 or whatever, all you've known during your adult life, or your, you know, um, uh, even if you're 40, you probably, you know, you, you, well, you're sort of in that situation. But a well, 35 year old, for example, all you've known is big migration, right? So you think this is normal because that's yep. all you've had your whole life. Yep. And the problem with that is it then creates this perception that it's normal uh, amongst the electorate. And they, so they don't think it's bad what we're doing because that's all they've ever known. Whereas you and I are old enough to have seen what it was like beforehand when it was a lot better. Um, but then you just, you know, then you're just a racist dinosaur. So that's basically, you know, <laughs> oh, you're just a, you know, just a middle-aged white man, you know, blah, 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 you know, that sort of crap. So, um, but yeah, it's just, it's just crazy. So they've sort of boiled the frog over 20 years. And then, you know, the frogs don't know that they've been bought and they think that that's normal. Yeah. Whereas I was just like, what, what the hell are we doing? Like, we used to be like this and now it's this. You know, I remember when in the 90s when I was driving my car around the mid-90s, um, you know, my peas and stuff, uh, there was not much traffic in Melbourne. It was really, you know, it was cruisy. You'd go out, it was cheap. Houses were cheap, all this stuff. I didn't, unfortunately, I was too young to buy one at that time. But, you know, when you, um, but I remember it was really cheap. And, you know, cost of living was great. And Sydney would have been, yeah, you know, I always thought, oh, gee, Sydney's expensive compared to Melbourne, but comparative to what it is now, you know, Sydney around the Olympics time and before was a dream compared to what it is now uh, on, on all measures. And, and you know, you and I remember that because we were there when it was, when, when that's what it was. And, but the younger generation today, all they've known is the way it is now. So they, so it's easier for politicians to gaslight them mm. on it because they don't know any different. No, um, I, it's quite I a shame. Yeah, and I would also say that the quality of the politicians we've got are degraded significantly over time as well. So they seem yeah. le less able and interested to tackle some of the critical issues. Well, and what? So, sorry, what, 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 one thing on that. Um, I don't know if you ever heard the sunscreen song. It was on uh, from Romeo and Juliet soundtrack in '98. Everyone's free to wear sunscreen. So it's about this old guy who's dispelling wisdom to a young person, right? So I played it for my daughter who's 13, and it's hadn't heard of it for I don't know, 20, 30 years almost, and it still holds up today. So everyone, top in your everybody free to wear sunscreen, fantastic. But there's this sign, uh, there's this, there, there, there's this uh, sentence where the, the old guy goes, um, you know, accept some uh, inalienable truths, uh, prices will rise, politicians will, fl will philander, you two will get old. When you get old, you will fantasise about times when politicians were noble, prices were reasonable, <laughs> and, and, and young people respected their elders. And I'm like, that's me now, actually. Hang on, is this nostalgia? Like, 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 am I looking back in the past going, it was mm. great because it's nostalgia or was it actually great? But, but you know, because um, I'm always like, man, Melbourne was great in the 90s. I'm like that all the time. But it actually was really cheap. And mm. it was like cost of living was good. You could get a house very cheap. You could, you know, you could live on one income still back yeah. then. Like that is objectively, um, you know, that, that, that was objectively what it is. I don't think that's just nostalgia. But having listened to that song, um, I listened to it about, uh, over the weekend, actually, when I drove to a camping trip with my daughter, and I was just like, that actually did stick to me. Hang on, am I being that old guy? Like, fantasising about the past mm. just because I'm getting old, you know. But, you know, that's just a little so, funny but, anecdote. Well, the, but the point there is it isn't just that. It is actually the data shows it, right? And all the charts does, that you've yeah, been walking through this evening and I, and I share regularly, you know, the data doesn't lie. And, and, and you know, that's the real critical point, Right. That clearly, you know, perceptions change over time. Yes, but things are, are not going in the right direction. And you know, I think no. that's the point. And that's why this these conversations are so critical because it really does. It, it's data informed, and uh, you know, that's one of the things that that, that I specialise on here on the channel and, and you do through macro business, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, if people want to find more about what, what you think and where, what, what you do, where, where's the best place for them to go these days? Uh, so it's still macrobusiness.com.au, but I have, I've got to warn you, I've become a bit of a media tart. So okay. basically um, I seem to get a lot of requests these days. So uh, yeah, I did, you know, ABC Radio and um, Straight A, I'm doing... Uh, I was actually supposed to do Sky News tonight, and I said, "Sorry, I'm doing Martin North." So there you go. Um, but <laughs> um, I'm doing. Yeah, that's all right. No, they, they they want me to get on every every Tuesday night now. So I've said yes, but when you want me, I'll just say no on that that weekend. But um, that week. But um, I'm doing Ben Fordham, uh, 2GB Sydney Live tomorrow at about eight 
something AM. Mm. So that'll be fun. Um, so yeah, I'm doing a lot of that stuff. But basically, if you want to listen to my media interviews, um, I've got a YouTube channel, nothing like this. All it is, it's just my central hub of where I basically upload all my media interviews. Because effectively, I do all these ones everywhere all over the place and people can't find them because they're often buried in like a you know show podcast or whatever. And also, often they then delete those. So they're, they're, they're lost to history. So what I do is I just basically upload them to that. And uh, that's at uh, my, my YouTube channel is at Leithvo, L-E-I-T-H-V-O. Um, surprisingly, I'm almost up at 1,600 subscribers, which is uh, 1,550 or something, which is like taking me by surprise because I'm not really – all I do is just put up interviews. That's all I do. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's um, – yeah, if you want to stay tuned to all my media stuff I do, uh, that's where it goes. Um, and that's pretty much it. Macrobusiness.com.au and at Leithvo on uh, YouTube. I do have a, the same handle on Twitter, but I do not post on Twitter. I think it's a cesspit. Um, my last post on there probably was six, seven years ago where I argued with someone. Um, so now I just use Twitter purely as a, you know, to follow Tarek and um, Justin Farbo and, you know, Alex Joyner and other people I respect. So mm. uh, that's that. Well, Leith, I appreciate your time and your thoughts as always. Um, very penetrating and uh, very important. And um, we'll uh, put some links and things below for people to, uh, you know, go, go, go look at the <laughs> the shows you've been on. As I say, you know, the the, the pro media chart now. So I'm very grateful you're able <laughs> to find time to come on on DFA. You, you might be interested now. I did my first ABC TV interview in um, uh, 1997. Wow, um, and uh, I actually started accumulating um, those uh, shows, uh, and then put put them on YouTube, and uh, that's how DFA started. So <laughs> you you don't you don't know where you're going to end up. <laughs> that's it. Well, I mean, the, the whole thing is I've got I've got this weakness where I always just say yes, right? So I sort of said the start of last year, I kind of made the decision. I said, um, sorry to keep hitting this going, but I sort of said this. Look, I'm just going to say yes to almost everything. Uh, I mean, if you can do it, right? So if you do that. Um, to see where it takes me and mm. you keep you say yes and then they um, uh, thanks Drew um, you know if you say yes then they obviously go oh this guy's pretty approachable and ask you again and again and then before you know it I'm on you know 2GB radio I got Treasury Common Sense my business partner Dave does that as well every week and then you got this and I'm on a Saturday morning one here and then and now I've actually broken into the ABC finally which is great because it's always been um, you know Sky 2GB 4BC 3OW in Melbourne uh, all the you know so-called right-wing nut jobs, uh, you know, as, as the lefties like to call it. But yeah. um, I actually find those people pretty reasonable. They've all been always been incredibly nice to me and uh, treated me very well. But I, I finally got on um, ABC Radio on uh, on Stray Day and I did a 13-minute interview with them. It was fantastic. And they were really good. So um, hopefully I'll, ABC will be, you know, will actually get me on rather than just snubbing me. Mm. Well, I hope so. I certainly still do stuff on ABC even from here. So, uh, you know, they still uh, they got they got a long um, a long cardex of people, and they Mate, seem to. I'm, seem I'm to... the immigration guy. They don't like to talk about it. So, because uh, <laughs> of that, it's like I, I, I'm, you know, I, I've been tarred, uh, you know, with, well, with, with, with that. So, but I, I actually talked about that for 13 minutes on on Australia Day with. Um, you know, on ABC Radio, it was fantastic. I'm like, wow, they're really, and, and it was a really good discussion. It could have been two B, um, you know, two GB. It wouldn't have made it. Look, you wouldn't have known the difference. Mm. They were really mm. good. Yeah, excellent. Well, Lee Tham, I want to say thank you very much. Really appreciate uh, it. And uh, as always, um, plenty of uh, things to talk about. We'll get you back on down the track again um, if you can um, shake your shake your way off um, on Sky. On that, on that would be great. And um, There'll be so much information coming over the next few months, of course, with all of the data. So we'll we'll keep tracking that. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to take you offline. I'm going to close the show. See you later. Cheers. Thanks, Barn. Thanks, everyone. There you go, folks. Hope you enjoyed that. It's a very important conversation with Leith there. And uh, these uh, you know critical issues will continue to, to press. Next week, um, Damon Classen's back to talk about the, uh, the markets and what's happened uh, over the last month or so. So that'll be interesting. Um, so uh, check out that live show. And in the meantime, of course, I'll be making the occasional um, recorded show in the meantime. And uh, the doggies are still here. They've hardly moved the whole of the time. So that was uh, quite good. So uh, I'll have taken that for another walk uh, quite soon. Anyway, thank you very much. Have a great evening and look forward to seeing you on the next show. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. Cheerio. <laughs>